Hey friends, welcome to my channel, Life with Everyday Haley. If you are following along on my channel or you're new to my channel, welcome. I'm super glad that you're here and I hope that this video relates to you today and others on my channel. Um, as you learn about me, we are on a fertility journey. We are going through all kinds of testing after having recurrent miscarriage and loss. Um, and so we have certainly been on a ride. So I would encourage you to go to my channel for more information about the tests that I've had done and additional details about our journey. Um, but today I'm gonna give you an update on emotions. So I have two videos on my channel that were posted pretty quickly within a month of my first uh, missed miscarriage, which was my second pregnancy loss back in January. So that was a really hard loss for me. That was my first clinical pregnancy loss. Um, the first loss I had was back in um, September of 2023, and it was a chemical pregnancy. So very early loss, still traumatic, but I actually didn't know I was pregnant. So um, I didn't have the additional like emotions and the additional excitement um, as my second loss. My second loss was a missed miscarriage. We went in for eight and a half week ultrasound and found out that the baby did not have a heartbeat and was measuring too small. And so you can imagine just with a missed miscarriage how painful that is because, you know, you think everything's fine, your HCG levels can continue to rise, but something is going wrong with the baby or your body and you don't really know what it is. And unfortunately, we don't have answers as to that one. Um, we did not get answers as to um, why that happened. Um, but um, it has been two months and we may not have over two months and we may not have ha answers about that specific loss as to why but what we have done in the meantime is refocus our pain into motivation and i have gone through extensive recurrent pregnancy loss testing so i'm about to post a video on my channel um, in the next few days of the result of all of our testing so once that all comes back where do we go forward? And I kind of have an idea, but we're still pending a few more tests and some more information is coming out a little bit. So that could even change our course of plan. So make sure you follow along for a final update of here's was all my testing, here's what was found, and here's how we move forward. So I will say that um, if you go to my channel and you see those videos I shared <laughs> back in February of my emotions, I was in a very sad place. I was very emotional, very heartbroken, and I still am, but I found ways to process that in healthy ways. I still have bad days, but I do have good days as well, and I have just found myself um, learning how to cope with my loss and learning how to be okay in my current state of grief and just continue on with life in the healthiest way that I possibly can. So this is your encouragement video of if you are going through a miscarriage, I'm so incredibly sorry, but I am two months out and I'm doing better. I will say that I'm doing better. Before I get started, this is your trigger warning. This video is gonna talk about a lot of hard emotional feelings through pregnancy loss. And I don't share any of my personal perspective to offend anyone or to make you feel uncomfortable. So just know that the things that I'm saying come from a place of love and my honest struggle. I would definitely encourage you to keep watching to the end of this video to hear how God has worked in my heart through this experience. So this part's going to get a little rough, um, but the ending is worth it. So thank you all for watching and I hope this finds you peace. Am I back to who I was before this miscarriage? No. And I think things in life change us. And that's what happens with trauma as well. And experiences change us. And when our expectations are let down, we, we, we feel change in that. But it doesn't always have to be a negative change. And so what I'm trying to do is take my pain and take my sorrow and turn it into something positive. So in the very beginning, I was dealing with a lot of grief, a lot of um, guilt, a lot of shock and heartbrokenness and just really that state of this is big trauma recovery. Um, today, I am, you know, actively 
uh, pretty much back to normal physically. Um, I have been going through a lot of testing. The testing is really emotionally and physically exhausting because you're going to appointments all the time, talking about really serious stuff, very, you know, every, it's always on your mind, it feels like. And I've had extensive testing. I mean, so much testing. And so that has been a, a stressor on me of just all the blood work, the exams, all the things. Um, and you can see videos on my channel of some of the things that they have, have done um, to test me. And again, I'm gonna share a video of all my tests um, at the end of my journey um, of testing. But that has caused me to kind of shift my focus maybe away from grief and into let's find answers. So in a way that's been motivating for me, but at the same time it has kind of been exhausting because you're constantly thinking about it, constantly trying to interpret results, constantly waiting for doctors to let you know the details. Um, it's just a lot. It's one of those things where I've told myself, you know, put yourself out there, advocate for your health, and it will pay off for you. And the more you know, the better they can treat you as you move forward. And my goal through that was just try to advocate for yourself, try to avoid this from happening again, and try to figure out why, because I just feel like there's a reason for a miscarriage. Even if it means that it was bad luck and the baby, you know, had chromosome issues, there's still a reason for it every single time. It doesn't just happen. And so I just wanted to figure out if I could avoid me from having losses in the future. So that's been a lot of, a lot of my emotions have been poured into that. I have felt like I've just had to be tough. I've learned how to give a lot of blood. I have endured a lot of different tests that weren't so pleasant. And I have just told myself, you know, this is your way to try and gain control back of the situation. Even though we lose control when we lose our children, when we have infertility, we lose that control. Um, we don't have that control at all. And so it really just makes you feel very hopeless and helpless. And so at least through recurrent loss testing, you have some power to try to figure out what's going on with your body. And they can actually figure out so much about you based on a lot of the recurrent pregnancy loss workup. So make sure you tune into more information on that from my channel. So again, a lot of exhaustion, a lot of tiredness, a lot of, you know, going to the doctor, even when I didn't feel like it, trying to work out, you know, going to the doctor, going to the fertility clinic, even in my work day, or when I'm, you know, trying to balance my job and everything else in life and my marriage. And so your period of testing will be kind of intense. I did go um, above and beyond and like really hit every single doctor in my care team and just say, what can we test? So I did a lot and I did that to advocate for myself. And I knew if not now, when? So that is what the past, you know, month and a half has looked like for me. I'm just a lot of testing and I'm, I'm very glad that I did that. I would encourage you to do it as well. Definitely make sure your insurance like, you know, covers your testing or most of it so that you're not hit with extensive bills. Some of it you can't avoid, but some of it you can. That would be my encouragement to you. And again, advocate for yourself and just stop thinking about, I don't wanna upset the doctor. I don't wanna be a burden patient. Just let those thoughts leave your mind and just think about, I need to advocate for my health and my future. Because at the end of the day, you're the lady that will go through the loss again. Nobody else. On that side of things, I've been kind of stressed out. I've been doing a lot of testing. But on the emotional side of things, I wanted to talk with you about how I feel today, maybe what's challenging for me and how I have found peace in my current situation and how I feel like God is working in my life. So um, again, I am taking a lot of supplements. I am trying to improve egg quality, trying to focus on better health there. I'm walking every day or trying to, which helps me meditate, clear my mind, spend time with my dog and focus on my mental health after work. I am, you know, making an effort to still hang out with friends that I can hang out with right now, um, still do things with my husband and our marriage, still go out to dinner, still 
you know, try to be normal people because we are normal people. We, we have had loss and we have had tragedy, but I hope that we can feel normal again soon. Um, I still don't really feel totally normal, um, but how can you after what you've gone through like this? Um, the more time goes by, the better I feel like my mental health is doing. Um, the more I feel accepting of what happened and can look toward the future. Um, the more time goes by, you know, I've been in therapy. And so going to therapy, you know, I think I go every two weeks, maybe every three weeks. Um, that has been really helpful for me just to talk to somebody. And if you feel like you need to seek a therapist every week, do it. I've already thought about when I get pregnant again with the anxiety of that. I probably need to be in therapy once a week. So I'll be talking with her about let's let's do this once a week to keep me balanced, to keep me uh, from being super stressed out and worried through my first trimester and all things. So um, again, this is a learn as you go process. When you've struggled with recurrent loss and you're going through testing or you're attempting to try again, you've never been through it before. You don't know what to expect. You don't know why it's happening. You don't know if you're even gonna find a reason for it. So give yourself grace and just know that you're not gonna act like your normal self when you're in the midst of grief and nobody should expect you to. I don't act like I used to act because I'm not the same person. I have been through existential grief and I have to recover from that. And my therapist encourages me to give myself grace, to know my limits and to respect that. So. Um, communicate with your spouse about how you're feeling, your limits, and that would be my encouragement to you. Like, because what I've what I have found is that my husband has processed our losses very differently than I have. And not to bash the males, that's not my purpose, but just to say, females process loss a lot differently. We deal with the physical pain of the loss. We deal with the the bonding pain of losing our baby, the hormones changing our bodies like it is a whole body spiritual experience to become a mom and then to have that ripped away that they just don't have they don't have that experience and so he has struggled to understand the depth of my grief and pain and why I'm so scared as we move forward and why I've been so passionate about these tests so we've had to get on the same page about that so try to have open conversations and understand that your spouse, your husband may have a different perspective than you because he's not you. So some things that I'm dealing with right now um, that I have had to work through, I'm trying to work through, um, and you can definitely talk to your therapist about these things if you relate, which these things are very common in the women's community, the recurrent pregnancy loss community. These are the infertility community. These, these feelings and thoughts, I see them very consistently in on social media and posts and on TikTok. So I feel like it's not just me, but sometimes it is kind of isolating in this time. So I have reached out to several women on TikTok, made connections with people in similar situations as me, and just really found a lot of peace in the YouTube and TikTok community and Instagram as well. So um, that would be a piece of advice I have for you is connect with people, stay connected, don't isolate because Isolating yourself is very common to want to do in this time, but really you need to find people that can relate to your, your path and where you've been. And you can learn from them, connect with them, and really find empathy through those friendships. Um, so let's talk about, yeah, some things I'm struggling with right now. The first thing is friendships. So just <laughs> friendships with individuals that are pregnant are really is really triggering for me. So I really have had to set a boundary there. My therapist told me basically, don't push yourself. If you can't be around pregnant women, then just communicate that to someone. Like, to be honest, I haven't really communicated that much. I really just kept the distance. But if someone asks me, hey, why are you not, you know, coming around me? I really think it's kind of an unspoken understanding because most people in my life that are pregnant do know what I've gone through. Um, but at the same time, you could always just say, you know, it's very triggering for me to be around a pregnant woman right now. Um, and it's not about, let me just clarify this because you see a lot of stuff about this on social media. It's not about, it's about jealousy. A lot of people that don't understand 
being in this position think that women like me that have had losses and can't be around pregnant women, that the emotion inside that inspires those feelings is jealousy. Let me just clarify that I do not feel jealous of other pregnant women. I feel triggered to being, being around them. And what I mean by that is when I see a pregnant woman that has had a successful pregnancy, it makes me go into an internal spiral of like self guilt and like, what's wrong with me? Like, and I, I think about things like, why is it working for them and not me? Like it's, it's an internal insecurity struggle and it's not fueled by jealousy. It's fueled by fear and it's fueled by like, what's wrong? And I don't know the reason, like, I don't know the reason why this happened and this is freaking me out. So I just want to clarify that it's not, it's not fueled by jealousy. Like we don't, when we see it, when I see a pregnant woman and I feel those internal feelings of panic and stress, it's not jealousy. It's like, it's triggering, it's PTSD, it's why did my pregnancy end and why, you know, why can't I be like them and what's wrong? And I don't know the answer and I'm trying to figure it out and I can't. And that's what your mind does. So it's not a jealousy thing. Honestly, I see pregnancy as a blessing from God. And before I went through this, I was happy for everybody that got pregnant. And I just thought, you know, someday I'll get pregnant and it'll be great. But now it's like extremely traumatic and you're brought back to the moments of the loss and you're brought back to the moments of how painful it is to have had to endure that loss of your child. And so I just want to clarify that. There's no jealousy in my body. It's simply grief and it's simply pain. And so again, communicate that. If you have somebody in your life that you're really close to that's pregnant, that you can't really avoid, if it's a sister, a, you know, a close friend, I don't know, any a coworker, you know, I would just encourage you to openly communicate and be like, it, your presence is just really triggering for me. They may not understand that, but if they love you, they will respect you for that. Um, and so I have been avoiding mainly my friends that are pregnant because it's just too much for me. And I know that when women are pregnant, they want to talk about their pregnancies. It's super exciting for them. But what I have found is some pregnant women can't talk about other things because it is such a big part of your life that they don't really know how to talk about anything other than their pregnancy. And if that's the case, then I just can't open up my heart to that right now. Like that's just not something I can do. And if you are a friend to someone who's going through loss and you're not, I would just encourage you to try to understand like the depth of the pain that that person is experiencing, you know? Um, and I know you're not going to be able to empathize with that, but just understand that it's not about them not loving you or caring about you. It's about their pain, but like, that's all I can say. So I just want to clarify that. Another thing that is still triggering for me, it was extremely triggering for me in the beginning after my second loss, but it's still triggering for me right now is babies crying. So at church, when a baby starts crying and I hear the sound of a baby, um, I'm automatically very, very triggered. Uh, it was really bad at first, but that's still a thing. So I, you know, seeing a baby, seeing a pregnant lady, you know, seeing a baby, you know, a mom carrying a baby carrier with the baby inside of it, all of that stuff, again, just really brings me to a place of sadness and, and fear and shame and guilt and a lot of really negative things. Um, and so those are things I will have to work through because I can't avoid pregnant women for my entire life. Like I know that and I can't avoid babies. Like I know that and babies are beautiful and sweet and you know, I want to be able to be there for my friends, you know, and their pregnancies and their baby showers. But like, it's, it's just really hard when you've, when you've had a pregnancy loss. And I'll say that, you know, even if you're dealing with infertility where you're not pregnant, a lot of these feelings are the same. Um, but I will say that it's, I believe it's another layer of grief 
in these situations if you were pregnant and the baby has died because that's that's like extremely triggering in these situations so my thoughts and feelings are specifically related to someone that has had pregnancy loss and then is now in the world of normal pregnancies but i just want to call that out that not being able to get pregnant for a while this these things can also be triggering for you um baby showers so i actually did go to a baby shower that i had for a family member and um was really concerned about how that if that was going to trigger me um because i'm easily triggered i'm not gonna lie and it actually was fine um i enjoyed it i was very um supportive and i did get a little sad um uh, just at seeing my family so excited about the baby um, and just feeling like, wow, like I don't have this like to get excited about. Um, I'm not gonna lie, that was hard, but I just put my focus into trying to make the day beautiful for my family member. And I actually had several family members tell me they were proud of me for what I did that day. And I was proud of myself. And it told me, you know, you're strong. You do have the power to overcome this and it'll be okay. Um, and I'm still praying for my baby showers. Another thing that's been quite triggering for me is pregnancy announcements on social media. So some women during this time just kind of distance themselves from social media. Some women I've heard just kind of when they see one, they just kind of scroll past quickly. Um, those announcements are really triggering for me and have caused me pain multiple times. And it's not, again, it's not jealousy. It's not resentment it's a reminder that something's wrong with you when you see that and it feels like oh crap what is wrong with me or why is this working for everybody else that wants the same thing as me but not me um and so i just wanted to share that with y'all that that is a very common emotional reaction and i haven't figured that out yet honestly um it's specifically painful when you see announcements for the same month that you were due so like for me, back in February last month, a lot of people were announcing their August pregnancies um, due dates, and that was me. And I was planning on announcing it last month, and um, that didn't happen for me. So that never gets easier. It never gets easier. And then the months like following up to when your due date was supposed to be really hard for me too, because I always think, well, I'm not pregnant right now. I, I've kind of lost track of how far along I would be. That's probably a good thing. Um, we'd probably be finding out our gender soon, but you know what? I'm glad that I've lost track because that's too much for me to take on. And I do have it in the back of my mind, like August is going to come around and I'm not, I don't, I don't get to reach that due date. So I still pray that I will hopefully be pregnant again by before August comes around. Um, so maybe some of that pain will be alleviated, but it's hard. It's just really hard to be in this place of infertility or pregnancy loss and feel like people, it, from the outside, it looks like people just get pregnant so easily. And we know good and well that we don't know people's stories. We don't know their past, how long they tried, their background. You know, they don't know what, you don't know what people have gone through or if they've struggled at all. But it does feel when you see those things like, why is this happening so easy for everybody else? So very very difficult very very difficult um and i don't want you to feel guilty for feeling this way because it's like there's nothing that you can do to really stop feeling the way that you do and nobody should justify your feelings before i was in this position i would see certain people you know reacting strangely to you know in, in the realm of infertility or pregnancy loss and just I didn't really understand their reactions to things um and I never really took the time to care about it or understand it and now that the roles have reversed and I'm in this battle it totally makes sense and it's just the way that it's going to be and I would encourage people to try to be sympathetic and not judgmental to women that are in my shoes. And I, quite frankly, I really don't care what people think of me. I'm focused on my healing journey. I'm doing what I have to do to be okay. And the people in your life that really care about you, 
should respect that and should understand that and should know who you are as a person and know that your actions are not meant to be that of jealousy or ill intent or anything negative, but you're just simply trying to heal a broken spirit because that's what I would describe this as is a broken spirit. Another thing that was really triggering for me, well, this continues to be triggering, is going back to the doctor's office. So being in the office um, for the testing and being around pregnant women and, you know, um, in the same place where I got some really bad news before, even just being in the parking lot or driving past that building triggers me, or it did a lot at first. And so I've worked through a lot of that um, the longer time goes by, but you just, like, I know when I get in the waiting room, I just have to try to not think about the pregnant women around me and just kind of tune it all out. It's so hard, but that's what you have to do. So unfortunately going back to the OB or even the fertility clinic can be triggering for you because you're like, it's just a lot going on in your mind. And then at church, so we're avid church goers. Every week we go to church and we're very involved and Oh, church was hard. Church was so hard for me to get back into. Just the courage to come back out in public in a large social setting. It took me several weeks to feel ready to do that. And I felt like everybody knew what I had gone through and just thought I was weird. And just, you know, all this negative attention that I didn't want, you know. And, of course, it's so weird because I hadn't announced my pregnancy. So nobody knew I was pregnant. And then everybody finds out what happened. And it's just like terrible, you know. So, of course, nobody responded to me negatively. Nobody said anything inappropriate or anything like that. But in my heart, it was just hard. So we did virtual church for a little bit after our loss. Um, definitely weren't going to any church things. And we were very actively involved in a um, class for young and married couples. And I really love that class. I've loved it for years. We both do. But I haven't been going back to that class. And, you know, the first few Sundays, I think we went back to worship. But then I was feeling exhausted. So I was like, after worship, I just wanted to leave. So we didn't go to classes. So... We've switched our class at church, and those are things I've been struggling with. And maybe someday I can move past those feelings, you know. But um, it's rough, guys. It's rough, and it's real, and it's real life. Um, so up on a positive note, something that has really helped me feel supported and happy and um, like I'm on the right path is seeking a fertility specialist. So that really changed my perspective, my outlook on my care plan and my treatment and how we're going to move forward. And again, there are so many resources and opportunities out there for you for fertility assistance. And I love just that the fertility clinic has gone deeper with testing with me and hopefully helped me found like root causes to some of my issues. So tune in for some upcoming videos on that information but just having that extra layer of support that my OB just did not seem to, to offer has been so helpful. You know, just knowing that I'll be followed through a pregnancy again to hopefully be successful means a lot. And I'm finally getting the resources and the medications that might can help me as I move forward. So that has really changed my outlook to be more hopeful. I will say that hope is... Is a hard word for me right now. Um, I know that hope is really just truly what keeps people motivated to keep going in life. I have struggled with having hope that I will have a successful pregnancy. Um, I know that statistically the odds are in my favor. I know that the more testing I do, the more I find out. Um, but it's so hard after multiple losses to just actually feel like it's gonna happen and not feel like the same thing is just gonna happen again. So again, it's a psychological mind game. If you take yourself out of the situation, you might view it differently, but you can't. Like I can't take myself out of the, the emotional pain that I've been in. So I think my husband is way more hopeful than I am. I will say that doctors are very helpful for us most doctors that we talk to seem to be like, you know, 
it'll happen when it's meant to happen and your testing looks pretty good and you know let's just keep rolling so again that's why that testing is so important to your journey and figuring out what's going on and that can lead you to have hope for a success um, but would encourage you to be in the word spend time with god meditate open up your heart to him let him know how you're feeling um, I've asked God for several things lately. I've asked God for why I've been asking and, and, and you want, you know, you say, should you do that? I don't know if I should do that or not, but I've been asking God for a reason. I've been asking God to help us find a reason for my losses so that we can help treat it and move forward with it. Um, I've been asking God to give me a sign that everything's going to be okay. Um, you know, there's just little things I've been praying for, and I don't know if he'll give it to me directly or if he'll find little ways to reveal himself to me in my journey, but I think he's already doing that. And um, that's one reason why I started my YouTube channel, because through this channel, I have found purpose in sharing my story. I have connected with several women. I pray that my videos help someone that may be in a similar boat as me, but I've always been a person that feels confident sharing her feelings and not everybody has that confidence or that personality and that's totally fine. And so I wanted to use my channel as a platform for peace and hope and enlightenment and relatability. And so I've actually found a lot of peace and it's almost therapeutic for me to get on here and share with you guys. Um, because we can relate to each other. So if there's anybody that understands your pain, it's me. And that is my purpose for sharing my story. Um, so I do have a nursery room created. We don't have furniture yet, of course. So when we got pregnant the second time, we had talked about getting some bills paid off and some, I actually have a car I just bought, um, paid off this year before um, I got my mom car. I got my mom dream car. So that does give me hope that someday I'll have a baby rolling in my, my dream car. Um, but we, we talked as a, as a family unit about, you know, let's get our, let's get your car paid off before we buy a ton of baby stuff. And I was like, absolutely. I totally respect that. And, you know, I was like, I'm barely pregnant, you know, let's wait a few months for baby showers and then see what we need to buy after that. That was kind of our plan, you know, you know, it's first, it's the first grandbaby on both sides. So we're like, you know, we'll be getting some big gifts. We hope we pray for that, you know, cause having a baby is, that's a lot of money all around the board, fertility care, baby care, baby stuff. It's a lot of money. And so I don't have anything big, which I'm glad we hadn't bought anything really big that would have made it even more painful. Um, but I do have a nursery I've created with, um, a pretty accent wall I, I made a few years back. I've installed a pretty light fixture. You know, I have a little rocker that I got from someone selling it in my neighborhood. So I've done a few little things, nothing too big, but that room has been difficult for me. I was going in there when I was pregnant and I was praying and reading to the baby and bonding with the baby and talking to the baby and you might think, oh, why were you already doing that? Well, that's just the kind of person that I am. I was already reading to my baby <laughs> in my first trimester, even though, and my husband was like, they don't even have ears. It doesn't matter to me. That's not the purpose of me doing that. Um, and so I bonded with my baby right away. And um, I know that next time I need to be more cautious and not get so bonded but like you love your child and I don't know how to not bond with my child like but anyways the nursery um was really triggering for me after my second loss and I actually felt really stupid and angry and I thought why the heck did you create a nursery for no reason when you're never gonna have a baby to put in there and I just went through like a lot of negative thoughts and I had to overcome that and I'm still trying to work through that, but I can say that I can go in there now. Um, for a while I had to just keep the door shut and I told my husband, I was like, we're keeping the door shut. We're not going in there. Um, you know, and I was like, like leave this door shut at all times. That's what I told him. And 
throughout the months, like I can go in there now and the door is open now. So the door is not shut and I can walk past it. You know, okay. If I go into the nursery, I feel a few things. I feel, first of all, it's a really sweet and precious room. So like my mood automatically lifts when I'm in there and it's sweet. Like it's a baby's room, you know? So it's very sweet. And so I find myself finding hope in that room. And my mom tells me, you know, that room is a sign of hope for your future. So just don't give up. And so something I've done recently, and I've seen this throughout social media, is if you do have a nursery put together, but you don't have a baby yet, um, or you've lost your pregnancy like some of us, unfortunately, um, go in there and pray. Turn it into a prayer room. Go in there and pray for your future. And so that's what I'm going to start doing, is going in there, sitting in the rocker, and praying to God to bless the baby, to bless the room, and to bless my womb and my next pregnancy. Um, so if you have created a nursery, don't feel stupid like I did, but just feel encouraged. You know, feel like the nursery makes it real and feel hope. And I do kind of get sad when I think about the baby I lost because that was supposed to be their nursery. But we have to remember that God has a plan in all things. And there's a reason for loss, whether it's avoidable or not avoidable. And we have to figure that out. We have to work through that. But God has his hand and plan in all things. And we have to trust in his plan for our lives. Something I'm trying to do is, in, is increase my faith in God's ability to create miracles in my life and his ability to intervene and work. And I do see him already working in every part of my situation. I see him working in the doctors I've received. I see him working in the testing results I've received. I've seen him working in my marriage, in my family. I've seen him working and there is a plan that he is creating for us and our family. And I have faith that he is not going to disappoint us. I have, a, I have faith that he is going to lead us to success in one way or another. One thing I did want to share was a common theme you see in response to infertility struggles and people that might not understand is the theme of why don't you just adopt? And I'm just going to share my perspective on that statement as a woman, specifically as a woman recovering from pregnancy loss. So again, this is simply that perspective for me. I talked to someone this past week that was in my shoes and was previously in my shoes and she has gone on to have a successful pregnancy. She was telling me that when she had her losses, her miscarriage, that the thought of adoption, or she just didn't want to entertain it. And I wanna say that that is so relatable to me right now because, and I'm not saying I would never want to adopt. That is not what I'm saying. I think adoption is so beautiful. I'm saying that when you've had a pregnancy loss that was your child inside of your womb, that you created and that you knew was there. And I want to figure out how I can carry it a full term. I think for me, I've been okay in the waiting for the past couple months because I haven't felt ready to try again emotionally or physically for that matter. And I've still been going through so much testing that I've just been kind of allowing my body to heal. And I remember between my first loss and when I got pregnant with my second baby, I was really eager to try again. I was like, let's just try again. You know, I want to be pregnant. Let's just get this on the road. And we did, we got pregnant again really fast, but now things are different. Cause now it's like, oh, you know, ouch, the second one hurt really bad. And is there a reason for this? So I just want to share that that's how I felt. I haven't felt real eager to try again. I really felt more eager to get answers to our testing and just rule out anything that could potentially be going on. Um, and again, we are finding some things in my, in my testing. So I just want to share that 
when I had my fertility appointment, transparently they told me, you know, in one third to a half of cases, we can find a reason for this. And guys, I think I might be one of those people that we found a reason. So more to come on that. Um, that's a kind of a new, a new development in my, in my health plan. One of my last tests that I did kind of showed something that was maybe a problem. Um, and so I just want to say that, you know, finally getting answers potentially does create a sense of relief as to like, oh, like maybe I do have an answer, you know, maybe we can fix this. Um, but at the same time, sometimes we don't always get that resolution. So this process is really hard. But let me just share with you guys that I feel so strong now. I feel so powerful. I feel like bulletproof now after what I've been through and what I have done the past few months with this testing and all of these appointments and all of this advocating. I'm like, I'm bulletproof. And I hate that it took this situation to make me feel so strong but it worked and I'm a tough cookie. I went through a lot and look at me, I'm still here and I'm still doing pretty darn well. And I thank God for that. And I do feel like God in the prayers of others uplifts you and keeps you strong even in your hardest times. I feel really tough. I feel like I can handle after what I've been through. I feel more confident to handle, you know, pregnancy, uh, the birthing process after all my tests I've had done. Um, I feel more confident that, you know, after going through my loss and my miscarriage and the whole process of that, that, you know, I can handle contraction pain. I feel like, um, this whole situation has just reaffirmed our beliefs that we are excited to, have to be parents and that we are ready for that step in our life. And we're just waiting for God to bring us our rainbow baby. And it's just reaffirmed that this is even after through the pain, the loss, the testing, this is what we want. And that hasn't changed at all. And I feel that that's a calling from God, that God is still putting it on my heart to be a mom, to want to be a mom, to want to try naturally. I think that is a huge green flag, as you could call it from God, that he's placing that on our, on our being. My, our marriage has gotten stronger. We've learned to connect better. Uh, we've learned to talk things out better. Uh, we've bonded through all of this. Um, I've appreciated his support. He's appreciated my support. Um, I just feel like this whole situation has made us, has set us up to be better parents someday and has set us up to appreciate the gift of a child. So I feel like and my entire, and our entire families, you know, like my mom said the other day, wow, whenever this baby comes into this world, think about how much love we will give it. Like think about how much appreciation we will have. Think about how much joy we will have. And she's right. This has just magnified our desire for a child and our desire to be a good family and to raise this child in a good environment. And so, yeah, I think I'm going to be a rock star mom. And I don't know if I would have been this good of a mom if I hadn't gone through all of this because I've had to fight for it. And now I realize how much I'm wanting even after all of that. So God works in our hearts. Um, I, I remember when I was pregnant, I was like caught up on the little things because I didn't have anything big to be caught up on. I didn't realize I had a problem like this. I remember, you know, a quote from somebody saying, you know, when everything's going right in your life, it's a lot easier to worry about the little things. Um, if something is actually crucially, critically going on, then you'll start focusing on those things, you know, because that'll be like really important. Um, and so I think that's true about life. Like when life is good, we can get caught up in the little things. But when life is bad, we are forced into critical situations and dealing with them. So that's what I've been in. But when I was pregnant, I remember just being really torn up even about like what gender I was going to have. I remember just like, oh, what's it going to be? You know, all like, I hope it's this. I hope it's this. That has gone out the window for me. 
I will openly accept a boy or a girl from God. I will openly understand that God brought me that gift um, at the right timing, the beautiful, viable pregnancy at the right timing, whether that's a girl or a boy. It is meant to be from God. I have accepted that, which is huge. I remember like worrying about like baby names, like all caught up on that. And babies, your baby's name is important, but having a viable pregnancy and child that is healthy to me means more than anything now. And so, no, I am not really that concerned about that either. Um, I remember being concerned about the nursery and like colors and what was I going to decorate with and furniture. And you know what? All of that stuff is so special, but that's not my main focus anymore. My main focus will be making sure that my pregnancy is healthy and my body and my baby is okay. And all of the other stuff will just fall into place. I remember being so obsessed with like my baby registry and I already have that completely done by the way. I'm a, I'm just a planner, um, which I'm glad that I got that over with, you know, but it's like, I remember just obsessing over baby stuff and what clothes and items and toys and none of that really matters, does it? No, it does not. So God has worked in my heart. And, and I remember even, even stressing out about well, what are we going to do? with the baby when they're born and like my job and like, how am I going to do this? Am I going to be a good mom? Am I going to lose a lot of sleep? Like, is this going to be terrible? Like you always hear about newborns. I remember being so worried about birth. Like, can I do it? Am I, you know, strong enough to do it? Am I, is this going to hurt really bad? Like, can I do this? Y'all, I, all I can say is God took all of that and let it go. I don't have any of those fears anymore. I have none of them. I literally have none of them. He took all of those very minuscule details that were clouding my vision and my heart away. And he has placed the idea on my soul that the most important thing is your beautiful, healthy baby and making sure that your pregnancy is okay. So I just wanna share that with you guys, that my perspective is so pure and so healthy now, and I won't be stressed out in pregnancy about little things. I won't be stressed out about baby showers or any of it, honestly. If I can have a successful pregnancy and achieve that, then all of that stuff will fall into place on its own. And y'all, it's just a perspective shift of having a healthy pregnancy is a blessing and miracle from God and nothing else matters, guys. Nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. So I'm thankful to God for changing my perspective and allowing me to grow as a person and like I said, I'm not afraid of the newborn phase. I'm not afraid of breastfeeding. I would lie if I told you I wasn't afraid of the birthing process because that is scary because you've never been through that. But I know I'll get through it because I've gotten through everything else. And God will get me through it. So I just want to share my, my heart has grown substantially through this. My spirit has grown. My soul has grown. I've become more wise and understanding and patient. And the person that I am today is much, this makes me want to cry. The person that I am today is much more prepared for motherhood than the young lady last year that had never had a loss. And I'm confident in knowing that if I had not dealt with this, especially my second loss and all that I've gone through, I think I would have been a good mom. 
I don't know if I would have appreciated it to this level. And I don't know if I would have been, I, I don't know if I would have had this level of strength that this experience has given me. This, this level of endurance, this level of, hey, things are tough, we get through it. So I thank God right now for that and what he did to work in my life and in my marriage and in my soul. And so I am actively praying for my rainbow baby. I will actively be praying for y'all's rainbow babies. And if you've seen this video and you relate to it and you're like, wow, I get that. Lo would love for you to comment below. Again, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I hope that my thoughts and feelings did not offend you in any way. This is just my perspective. It's also important to remember that we all have our own unique perspectives. And so, and again, perspectives change over time. My perspective after my first loss was not the same as after my second. So um, if you need a friend, I'm here. I hope this video has been relatable to you. And again, I pray for your success on your journey. Tune into my channel for my updates on fertility appointments, my testing updates, and how we move forward. Thank you for watching this video. Hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you soon. Bye y'all.